every year in Russia, Japan, Korea and China, something weird happens. Millions of white little moths start flocking the trees of dogwood. Dogwood, in this case, refers to the genus Suida and Cornus, the plants that the moths are attracted to. In reality, it's not the plants they are attracted to, it's the females, hiding in these very plants. You see, the life cycle of this moth can only be completed on several kinds of dogwoods in temperate Asia, caterpillar spin cocoons in the trees, and a few weeks later they hatch into moths. The males hatch earlier than the females and start looking for females and mouses. Turns out this species is even labeled as a pest species, since the caterpillars can have itching hairs and can turn up in mouses. They also turn up as a uh, they also uh, are considered to be defoliators since uh, they can be very abundant and defoliate the trees. Welcome, welcome to another one of my videos today, my dear viewers. When it comes to moths, I have many interests. One of them is the silk moths or emperor moths, the family Saturnidae. Another big interest of mine are the tiger moths, the Arctinae. Both of these, you'll see a lot of them on my channel. But another interest of mine are pests and their ecology. I just think it's fascinating. Now, pest is a very artificial concept made up by humans. But I still find it interesting to think about the types of moths that are culturally, to our society, the most important. And they tend to be the ones that damage our crops or pose a threat to our health or anything like that. And today we are doing a Patreon sponsored episode. Uh, on Patreon you can set goals. And I set for $270, I set a goal, a special episode about the moth Ivela auripes. And guess what? We managed to hit this goal. So because of that we are going to celebrate with this special video. And I managed to obtain some material here of this pieces of the offending species that we are going to take a look at right now and answer some questions about the species in general. Let's see what's inside. Here it is. And here it is. This is what it's all about. This tiny white moth is the big offender and today we are going to find out if this is really a pest or not and take a closer look at their ecology in captivity as well. Now the specimen I'm holding here is not in perfect condition, it's, uh, it has damaged wings but that's not really a problem. They don't need to be perfect just to have an example for YouTube. And this is the female of the Ivela auripus the species that we are going to talk about today. Now the specimen I have here, which is a female, is a nice example to show for YouTube. However, there is a much, a much nicer example I can show you as well. Because I happen to have some overwintering eggs of this species. And my purpose is not to breed a million of them. My purpose is just to, uh, to show the life cycle from egg to moth in a YouTube video while we discuss some of the ins and outs of the biology of this interesting insect. Let's get started and thanks for the sponsorship. The eggs of Ivela auripes are laid against tree bark. As you can see, the eggs blend perfectly into the bark as they are coated with what seems to be a dark colored adhesive and glued very tightly to the surface as one flat layer. These eggs take about 9 months to hatch. This species is only reported to have one generation per year and thus the eggs need to overwinter and experience an extensive period of cold temperature before the caterpillars hatch from the egg mass. For a while though, it seems that I was lucky. In spring I was checking my overwintering materials and I found that indeed larvae were hatching. Here you can see 
some of the tiny babies hatching inside the container. Can you see the babies hatching? Aren't they cute? These are the tiny hatchlings that will eventually grow into snow white moths. I put them in a plastic box together with some of the earliest leaves of the common dogwood Cornus sanguinea in spring. I close the lid on them I let them sit at room temperature. Meanwhile, take a look at these eggs that are hatching. You can see the holes where the caterpillars have left their eggshells. So let's check back after a day. It seems the caterpillars have settled on the leaves of the dogwood uh, that I gave them and have actually started to chew small holes in it. Can you see the small bites they have taken from the leaves? The babies of Ivella auripus grow very fast and seem to cover the leaves they are feeding on slightly with silk. It also appears the caterpillars can hang by a thread and fall down if they feel threatened by something. Finally the caterpillars were about to shed their skins to the second stage. How intriguing! It seems that they do it together, in a web made of silk, where all the brothers and sisters gather to shed their skin to the next instar. A fun fact is that they don't do this in later instars, they aim only seem to shed their skins socially in the first instar. And here you can see me cleaning up the caterpillar box and including some paper towel on the bottom. Paper towel sucks up the ex excess moisture and keeps the container somewhat more dry. The second instar is more hairy. The caterpillars become hairier, hungrier, and look somewhat grey in appearance. It is in this exact moment that I decided they need a bigger cage. If I wanted to study the behavior of this moth more closely, they need a bigger environment. It's also better for the health of the caterpillars to not be in completely airtight plastic boxes once they grow bigger. They like some fresh air. So I suspended some of the cornet plant in water and put them in a small moth breeding cage. This is what it looks like. Do you like it? Much more space for my babies. I'm sorry that the cage is a bit stained and dirty. It's been used a lot, but guess what? The caterpillars don't care. It still works. Slowly they enjoyed their space and ate more and more and more. And then they shed the skins again. Suddenly they looked a lot prettier. They turned out to be much more hairy even and black with bright yellow patches. Caterpillars in this stage would wander a lot through the vegetation. They also had another funny habit, spinning sh shelters in the leaves and headbanging. <laughs> yeah, cool, huh? Now the reason these animals are considered to be a pest is because in Japan they can have very high population densities in areas where dogwood is abundant to the point of completely defoliating the dogwood. Research has revealed that dogwood plants can survive being defoliated once, but if it happens every year when the animals are very common in a region with annual outbreaks, it may kill the trees eventually. Another problem is that the larvae of this moth have mildly itching, urticating hairs that can disperse through the air, causing rashes or causing a potential threat to allergic people. However, let's assess the situation critically here. It does seem that this moth is more of a specialist that is only bound to its native food plants, dogwood. In Japan, usually Suida macrophylla or Cornus controversa are used. The thing is though, 
There is absolutely zero chance of survival for the insect if these trees are not present in the area. So when outbreaks happen in populated areas, isn't it perhaps an issue with urban design and landscaping? The issue is a lack of biodiversity in urban areas. When you plant too much of a single tree or plant species, then you create a monoculture. And the few species that depend on these plants can become overabundant. In Europe, we have a similar problem with the oak processionary caterpillar. Somehow, the government thought it was a good idea to plant oak trees everywhere especially alongside roads and in parks and residential areas. Turns out the oak processionary caterpillars take advantage of this. You could remove the oaks and replace them with other trees, but in the end it will only create an opportunity for other species to become abundant. In a biodiverse landscape, all species will be kept in check by their native predators and food competition. In Japan, Korea, China and Russia, giant dogwoods are often planted for decoration since they have beautiful flowers. This helps the species thrive in this urban monoculture. The good news is that many other species prey on the insect, including parasitic wasps, flies, insectivorous birds, beetles, assassin bugs and many more. However, their natural enemies may have trouble surviving in urban landscapes. And a more variable landscape with more native plant species will give predators the chance to keep the species in check, as well as planting a bigger diversity of trees, not only dogwoods. After a while, I was happy to see the first pupa. Yay! Surprisingly, this species has quite beautiful pupa for a moth. The, pu the pupa are creamy white, with a yellow band running over their backs and various black spots, not to mention the tufts of hair. What a crazy pupa that is! Interestingly, there seems to be a little bit of mimicry going on between the pupa and the caterpillar of severely um, potentially toxic species, including for example the Zygaenidae, Priera sinica, which both larva and pupa may resemble each other's shapes. Also interesting to note is that the Ivella auripes barely attempt to spin a cocoon at all and prefer to pupate within a folded leaf or just in plain sight, uh, suspended by some silk strings. Eventually I gathered all the pupa and made a simple hatching container for them by putting them inside a cricket box with paper towels. The moths are quite small so the setup will work and is quite simple to keep up with. I would tell you more, but my video was disturbed by uh, a dog. Um, guys, I'm filming my caterpillars or my cocoons of Ivella auripus here. But suddenly there's a dog in my garden. And I'm telling you, I don't own a dog. <laughs> so what the hell is going on here? Um, hello? This is not part of the show, guys. This is like a random event. All right, thanks for peeing in my garden, dude. This is not my, my dog, all right? I just hope he's friendly. Hey, you. Come here, man. Hey. Yeah, you're a nice guy, but you don't belong in my garden. Come. 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 Come, come dude, here, I don't know who your owner is, but you should not be in my garden, alright, nice doggy, okay, no hard feelings, no hard feelings, but don't come back, alright, gee, my god, I don't like it when dogs piss in my garden, you know that, it's rude if people let their pets roam. Probably sound like a complaining old man now. But I work in my garden a lot and I don't appreciate dog shit and dog piss in my garden. Obviously the dog right there, it was a friendly dog. It was a cute dog. Seemed to be very friendly and curious. But I'm still not happy about this. Damn it. 
Eventually, the pupa started coloring up. It's easy to check on the moths forming inside because the shell of the pupa is transparent. The pupa only take about two weeks to hatch, <coughs> despite the larva taking over a month to grow from egg to pupa. I sprayed them with water to keep them a little bit moist. And there we have it, the first male specimen of the Ivela auripus. What a beauty! So I was just checking up on my pupa and imagine my shock. What do I see? You, can you guys see it too here on the lid of the container? That's right, our first Ivela auripus. Uh, we're going to like, take a closer look because uh, it already looks magnificent. I'm very excited. There you go. Very interesting looking moth, if you ask me. Let's see if we can get it on a stick. Here you go. Wow, look at that. It's quite a charming little piece, isn't it? Let's get a good close-up. There you go. What a beauty. And this is the Ivela auripus from Japan. This moth is mainly white, with two bright yellow forelegs and big black antennae. Interesting to note is that when disturbed, the species appears to have some type of thread pose. They fall to the floor and spread their wings widely. I wonder if the white color actually works as some type, type of uh, warning or aposematism. Their host plant is toxic after all. Cornus contains iridoid glycosides but there is no evidence that the moths sequester these toxins, which would mean they are chemically protected. Another option is that they try to mimic moths from the genus Eproctis, which are also commonly white and covered with defensive itchy hairs. In order to find the females, the males have very large and sensitive antennae. Despite being day flying, they still rely on smell in order to locate the female. The next day, more males hatched. Let me show you a nice variety of males right here. Very charming and interesting little moths if you ask me. And it's day number two, boys. Turns out uh, five males hatched uh, in 24 hours time. That's an excellent timing. I wonder why they are so synchronized perfectly. But the problem is no females yet. And this guy here is trying to escape. Come on, go back in your container, dude. So I really want a female. These moths, it seems, or at least in captivity, tend to lose the scales on their thorax quite fast. Now at this point in the video I was quite frustrated. The container you're looking at right now shows us 12 males. Yeah, 12 individuals. This bothered me a lot, since I definitely need a female to finish this video. The point of this video was that I was going to show you all the life stages of this insect and if the female is missing, it would lessen the quality a lot. The good news is however I had one pupa left. Yes, one single pupa. And the good news is, the last pupa is a female. Life cycle completed. There she is, the female. She seems to be much bigger and fatter than the males.
I was hoping that the female would pair with a male, but sadly she didn't. So this bloodline did not continue. I'm not so sure why the males didn't show any interest in the female at all. I had no pairings. Usually moths from this family are very easy to pair. I guess I just had bad luck. It's not good to raise 12 males and only one female, so everything has to depend on one single individual. Which is not great. Maybe I'll have to try again someday in the future with more individuals, but who knows. Hey, uh, thanks for watching my video and I hope you enjoyed it. Bye bye. Thanks for watching guys. I really appreciate the fact that so many people are watching my channel now and it really motivates me to work on some really big nice videos in the future. There's one thing I want to say and you probably already guessed what it is. See, take a look at this. Yeah. My YouTube channel is not supported by YouTube. It is completely and permanently demonetized by YouTube. Why? I don't know. That's how it is. So my YouTube channel is basically a very big passion project. And I don't do YouTube to make money. I do YouTube because I love biology, I love insects and I want to spread some awareness about them and teach you something about them. However, it does really help when people support me financially and therefore I have a crowdfunding platform, it's called Patreon. But there are also other options such as LiberaPay and PayPal. And as annoying as it is to give you the same reminder at the end of all of my videos, I know it's annoying to hear it all over again, but it's what keeps my channel online and free to watch for everyone. I understand not everybody is able to contribute, especially during difficult times like these, and that's completely fine. This is only for those who are willing and able to, that like my videos enough and think to themselves, hmm, this is something worth supporting. So um, yeah, consider helping me out or subscribing to my Patreon. If not, I like the fact that you are just watching my videos. Uh, my channel has grown a lot. I'm working behind the scenes on some very big stuff. You'll have to be patient for me to release it, but it's going to be a very good uh, year for my channel. Hope to see you again. Oh, I should shave. I'm getting a little bit of a beard. Usually I'm always clean shaven. What do you guys think? Does it suit me or not? <laughs> right, bye bye.